We are live, I think. I think we're live. Okay, good on the YouTube end. I'm so sorry for the delay. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Zeitgeist on a Mighty Blaze. I am your host, Jane Roper. And with me, once again, is Kristen Arnett, author of With Teeth. This time I'm holding it um, holding it up the right way. Um, so excited to have you here with us today, Kristen. Um, Kristen Arnett is a queer fiction writer and a very funny, funny tweeter. You should all follow her on Twitter. Um, she's the author of With Teeth, a novel, uh, and the New York Times best-selling debut novel, Mostly Dead Things, which was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award uh, in fiction. She's also the author of the short story collection, Felt in the Jaw, uh, originally published in 2017, which will be re-released by Riverhead Books in the not too distant future, which is great. Um, her work has appeared at the New York Times, The Cut, Oprah Magazine, North American Review, BuzzFeed, McSweeney's, PBS NewsHour, and elsewhere. She has a master's in library and information science from Florida State University. I love that, one of my favorite authors and profs, um, Elizabeth McCracken, also as a librarian. Do you know Elizabeth? I do, I love her. <laughs> She's the best. I could see you guys hitting it off. Um, and you currently live in Miami, Florida. I do. Um, so <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. So psyched to have you here today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this, so I'm excited to talk. Excellent. So, all right. The first thing I want to talk about, oh, wait, I forgot. You know what? I want to read some of these awesome blurbs because they're <laughs> freaking great. The Atlantic said, uh, called with teeth, a gloriously messy, eminently Floridian tale of family dysfunction. Arnett pays brutal forensic attention to the pain that festers when family members ignore their wounds and those that they inflict on others. So, yeah, I wanted to talk the, the Floridian thing. Uh -huh. There's this thing about Florida, right? I'm thinking of other authors that I really like, like Lauren Groff wrote her short story collection, Florida. Mm -hmm. Basically everything Carl Hyacin writes takes place in Florida. Um, there's that book Swamplandia by Karen Russell. Russell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what is it about Florida that like just lends itself to, you know, this sense of place? Cause it's such a character in your novel. Yeah, um, I do. I consider myself to be um, a place writer, specifically a Florida writer. Um, I've lived in Florida my whole life. I'm 40. Um, it's a, it's like a, uh, I would say Florida is like not just like a character in my books. It's like a character in my own life. So it makes sense to me that um, I'd be able to like introduce it into work like that. It It's like a it's like a physical presence. Like being in Florida is like, right? Like the weather is like something that you have to deal with. Like the animal life and the plant life is something that you have to deal with. Like the people for sure are things that you have to deal with. The fact that like, I don't know, like when you're in Florida, it's like, it's it's very physical. It's like the the air touches you. Like being in the humidity, right? It's like, feels like a, like a hand on your skin. Um, dealing with like, I don't know, just dealing with living in a house in Florida is like the land constantly trying to take itself back, right? Mm. Where it's like, you're like fighting with a lawnmower all the time. There's like <laughs> things growing inside your AC unit. Oh, there's like a snake got into your uh, washing machine. That was me, like actually. <laughs> oh, really? That actually happened? Yeah. Oh, um, Jesus. Yeah, there's like, I mean, there's just a lot of things about it that like, it like demands your attention. It's like kind of like, um, like a, like a needy kid just like poking at you saying like, hey, 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 hey. Like I'm yeah. here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. You like, you literally can't forget about Florida because it's like, it demands and like commands your attention. So it's like, I mean, it's a place even like myself living in it. Like I'm constantly reminded of the stuff here. Mm, um, yeah. It's like, I grew up in central Florida. I live most of my life in central Florida. And it's a place where it's like, right, where it's like, I did a tweet about it like this one time, like, cause I was always like, I'm always on Twitter cause I'm very yeah. dumb online. But um, I <laughs> tweeted like one, just like offhanded very one time about like the fact that I was in my 7-Eleven that I really love to go to and a lizard sure. was in there. Um, and like the, you know, the cashier just joked around and he was like, oh, that's Marvin. He likes the smell. And that tweet went crazy viral. People were like freaking out about this lizard inside the 7-Eleven. <laughs> For me, I was like, that's just something that happens like in Florida, like, oh, right. like they're like, there's lizards inside your house all the time. There's lizards inside of buildings. There's like, you walk past a bush and if you like 
you know, your leg scrubs by it, like a billion lizards jump out of it. It's just like something that like happens in Florida, but like you don't necessarily think about all the time because it's something that's there. So right. anytime I'm working in like fiction, thinking about Florida, I'm trying to think of it as like the person who's like lived my whole life in Florida. And I'm like, what are the things that are happening around me constantly that are around me so often that I just don't even think about them anymore. Florida. Right. Like you don't necessarily. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's Florida being Florida. And I, yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine. I, I think that's a little bit how it is like living in the Boston area too. Like Boston just feels like this presence, this, I mean, we don't have, we don't have lizards and things in our <laughs> houses. We have raccoons and coyotes in our backyards, but it's not the same. It doesn't like impress itself upon your life. Speaking of lizard videos, did you see that? I don't tangent here, but there was somewhere, I don't know if it was in like Indonesia and it was like a freaking Gila monster climbing. You saw this? I did because so many people tagged me in it and they said, oh, is this Marvin? <laughs> like Marvin is doing well. And I was like, I cannot believe this. But yeah, yeah. yeah. that is not Marvin. That is not Marvin. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you're a fan of uh, 7-Eleven figures in the, in the book as well, I believe. Is it like a place to get wine and beer? and, and uh, you, can get, you can get a whole four course meal there. Like you can get it all at 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven yeah. is um, the one that I used to live next to. I considered it to be my like my neighborhood bar. It's yeah. 7-Eleven. Like, because it was like the place where I was like, that and like it felt like cheers, right? I went in there and right. they were like, oh, Kristen's here. Like I'm like, hey guys. And I'm buying like my drinks and I'm like hanging out. They let me do my book launch for with teeth. Um, not with teeth, for uh, Felt in the Jaw. When yeah. I had for a fiction collection come out, they I asked them if I could do my book launch there and they said yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is that is perfect. That is so perfect. I um, love a convenience store. Yes. Yeah, we now we have people asking about asking about lizards. We have your fans here asking lizard questions. Uh, <laughs> okay, so one of the you know the the central theme and plot of this book, it's it's very much about, you know, a mom uh who's 40-ish, I guess, in her early 40s, um, Sammy, who, well, when we meet her at the beginning of, the very beginning of the book, she has this young, you know, her son, Samson, is very young. Um, the book opens with him almost being abducted from the playground. Um, and then we, you know, we see her sort of how she navigates motherhood and how she navigates um, queer motherhood. Um, what I thought was really amazing and almost like revolutionary about this book was the way you treated motherhood and parenthood with such brutal honesty in that you showed that sometimes she, this Sammy couldn't fucking stand her kid. Like this is a difficult kid. And, um, you know, as, as someone who has had challenges, you know, with, with a particularly spirited kid i know like there are times when you're just at your wits end and what's fascinating about sammy is like she does the the thing she will let it get to her and i think i think so much of the time in non in fiction parents even if people authors show yeah parenting's hard you like take it that extra step to show like there's mm -hmm. actual ambivalence sometimes in being a parent like sometimes you're like i don't know if this is what i want Sometimes I even doubt if I like my own kid. Mm -hmm. um, there was a line in there. Uh, at some point, I think you um, you wrote that there's there's a scene when Sammy's feeling suddenly all sort of like cuddly and affectionate toward her son, and then and her thought is, "Thank God I do love my son," <laughs> you know. And I was just like, "Oh man, you like got it, like you hit it." So. Talk to me about your, you know, how you wanted to explore parenting in that, in this book and like what led you down that road? Yeah. Um, this was a book that started off as a completely different book. Um, mm. It began with, um, I was thinking about, because uh, I wanted to write about like queer moms. Um, that was something that I was really thinking a lot about specifically in Central Florida. I was like, this is something I want to write about. Um, and then I started off writing about, okay, well, what if there was a gay mom and her son, who's an adult, um, has some problems in his life and has to move back home with her? And like, what would their interactions be like? And what would that be? And I was like, well, that's interesting to me. Um, I'm fascinated in that. So I started off writing, I wrote about 40,000 words of that. Wow. And as I was for, writing- For lay people, do you want to say about how many pages that is? Oh gosh, it was like- like Say it's like about half so it's like at least 150 pages right. of book at least right um, and so i was like okay i'm going to like 
write this, but every page, like every page as I was writing, I found myself like talking about a memory that happened between them or like trying to explain like their dynamic by like bringing up something that happened in the past. And I was like, I'm more in the past in a memory than I am in the present with these two people. And I had to have this kind of like come to Jesus with myself. Yeah. Right? This is not uh, the book I am supposed to be writing. So I yeah. chucked all of those. And then like, I was like, okay, I'm going to start off. And I was like, what do I want to start off with? Cause I need to start off from these memories. Um, so I started off with the idea of this attempted abduction, like mm -hmm. this failed abduction. Right. I like, um, I was like, and this is going to tell me a lot about Samson and it's going to tell me a lot about Sammy right up front and it's going to be very active. Yeah. So as I was writing it, I was like, um, I'm going to um, really have this be very fast paced, right? Like all that stuff happens like in like what feels like a second, like which would, would it would be like to feel like as a, as a parent being like, this thing is all happening. It's happening really fast. But um, I was like, okay, so I want her, this, her reaction to what happens is going to be what informs like the tone of this book and yeah. her reaction to what happens. Isn't like, Oh, thank God I have foiled with this abduction attempt. Her immediate reaction is why did my kid try and get away from me? Yes. Like, what's wrong with me? Why didn't he, why would he want to go with a stranger or like people like judging me? Like, and I was like, this is the tone that we're going to start off with. Yeah. And that led me into like this, this story between like, you know, like a mother and son, but also like a family, like a, a very like, like dysfunctional family that mm -hmm. I was like, the dysfunction kind of like layers on itself. And it all happens in this like way in which like, um, it's more like, character study like it's like uh the idea that like everybody in a household is essentially an unreliable narrator yes like, yes everybody shares like same stories right like it's like everybody in a household whatever your household makeup looks like right, right. if you're like you know biological family if it's like your parents if it's like you know uh, a significant other if it's like friends that you live with you all share these kind of stories right stuff right like, holidays or like shared experiences, but like you ask one person what happened at something and you ask another person what happened and those stories sometimes touch, but yeah. they move away and maybe sometimes touching. And I saw it as this kind of helix of like, you know, like sometimes touching, like moving around, but yeah, um, it, it felt like, and so that's what, that's where a lot of that came from where I was like, I'm interested in telling a story about like a mother who's like kind of like on the brink, but like a much a lot of it too is like then being able to be like question like how much do we trust Sammy as like a narrator of this particular narrative? Yeah, that's a yes, and that's great because her perception of herself and her self doubt and and all of these things are going to factor into how it's filtered through her. Did you ever think about doing it like with the three different point of views, like with the two moms and the son? Yes, I did. I mean, you know, I thought about it a lot, um, especially because. Um, this book got picked up uh, by Riverhead at like, like uh, maybe seventy pages. Like oh 70. wow! Yeah. So and then and so I hadn't written the rest of it, and like my editor was like, "Okay, can you like talk to me about what's going to happen and like the plot and how it will end?" And I was like, "No, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, I cannot." <laughs> yeah. So he was taking a lot on faith, bless him. But um, I I did know that um, as I was working, so I considered. I was like, I don't know if I will have like Samson come in right and be like. A narrative. I don't know if I'll have like her wife Monica come in and be a narrative. But as I was working, it felt really important to me to keep focus on Sammy, like very because it's it's third person, but it's very close, yeah, like it's really close third person. Mm -hmm. um, because I was like so much of it, like to me, I wanted it to be like we trust her, trust her, trust her, and then things happen, and we're like, okay, I'm trusting you, but like you're showing me that it may be like, I'm not, I can't take you like, but I was like, I was like, I think if showing Samson or Monica in that same kind of close up third way felt to me, like they're all still like, they're all unreliable narrators in the same house. Right. So they're all too close to it. Right. So it's like getting Sammy's like skewed perspective would be getting Samson's skewed perspective would be getting Monica's skewed perspective. Right. Right. So it felt more important to me to put in, these like little interstitials is what I've been calling them. These little yes. inserts from strangers, because I was like, these are people who have no stakes in the family. Like, right. Maybe touch on the family at some points, like, you know, somebody's a therapist someone's a teacher, someone's yes. a stranger from a parking lot or a bar, like, um, but they yes. don't live in the household. And I was like, this is a better, like for me, I like getting these glimpses of like, well, here's what I see in this moment of interaction yes. or in these kind of spaces. And that, that was more, 
I feel like that told us more about like who she was and how the family worked in these like yeah. kind of different glimpses than it would be to get like dueling perspectives in a household. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and this way you get you get this really um, in depth portrait of her and and the way she is perceiving the world and sort of like the the chaos around her. Um, the the interstitials, just to go back to that for a second to explain to folks who may not have read the book yet. What you do is after some scenes, you take like a minor player in the scene and then you have a very short first person mm -hmm. reflection from them. Um, and I love that. So it, it could be like the, um, you know, the uh, the bartender at the bar she visits or like the, her neighbor or, so it's kind of unexpected. It was like this little treat and, and you see how that character perceives Sammy and also like what the character is bringing because everybody brings their own stuff to every interaction and it's sort of so at the same time it gives you this objective like sense of who sammy is it also like reminds you like everyone brings their own shit to everything like and how they perceive other people um i thought that was that was great and they look like they were fun to write too they were fun to write actually and and when i first wrote the book like the first draft as i went through did not have those in it Right. And I, as I was going back through, I was like, oh, what I really want is this like bird's eye view of this family. And I was like, how do I get that in there? And um, I was like, oh, I'd really love to just have like a pop, like less than a page of like, what did this person in the room think of that? Um, right. And, and it, it, or, or think of maybe like not even just like solely focused on that, but like what was their like, brush against it like you know right so um i wrote those all in like a day like i thought really it was so fun to write but i also i was like it gave me such an opportunity to pop out of that really close like almost smashed up against the storyline thing with sammy like yeah. it's intense like to be with her um and so i was like having these little perspectives was like almost like an exercise and like how how does like anybody else in a different part of the room see it versus like right like yeah. Sammy is like, if we're going to use an example, like Sammy's like been sitting in the same chair for a really long time. And so she sees the room this kind of way. And it's like allowing somebody else to pop down like in a completely different corner and be like, here's my particular perspective. And I'm seeing things you can't right. you have to move from where you are. Right. And that was fun to do. Yeah. It was fun. I mean, I think that's like, I mean, it just like, uh, if you're a writer, I think that's like a fun writing exercise. I was going to say, because it's almost, at first I wondered like, I wonder if she wrote these as little character sketches, like, you know, to try to get inside the mind of these minor characters, but which, which I'm sure, you know, it helps. Yeah. I don't know, maybe you went back and like rejiggered the scene a little bit once you had that background. But yeah, they also served to, I heard you say in another interview that you were trying to create a sense of claustrophobia, right? Um, yeah. With, uh, yeah, because like with Sam, like, her her life is uh, so much of the of the book takes place like in her house and Ooh. in the car driving mm -hmm. Samson to and from places and like being a mom who has teenagers like I can tell you yes so much of my <laughs> life is like in the house and in the car um, so you really you know and sometimes you can feel like your life has shrunk and and you get Ooh. that feeling with Sammy like she feels. Oh. Yeah, I mean that felt really important to me to do um, because. Uh, for my previous novel, like Mostly Dead Things, was such a novel that was like so outside that even when characters were inside, it felt like they were outside. Like mm -hmm. the outside was permeating inside. There was a kind of like um, wildness to it that like, I was like, this is a different kind of family. It's also different like layers of class that are here in this book. Like this isn't a family that's struggling with finances. They're not struggling right. with money. This is like a different part of Central Florida. Right. Um, and so like they're the way that like Sammy moves through things is like this way in which she's like, right. Like she's like constantly um, inside and like, the, there's like moments where like the outside taps in. And that was like the interesting part of working Florida in, right. Where it's like, she's right. in her backyard and noticing like a lot of like invasive plants or like, you know, she's taking her kid to therapy and there's like the lizard and like her kid is picking it up and like the tail falls off, you know, it's like right. stuff like that where it's like, um, but yeah, so much of her time, I was like, I wanted to start feeling smaller and smaller yeah. because her sense of self as a queer person, like with her own like queer identity outside of her wife and her son is like shrinking to the point where it's like she doesn't understand who she is outside of these roles. Right. So I wanted it to feel like it's like closing more and more, but she doesn't have like avenues of escape for herself. Right. Or the thing she says that she wants to do, she's like, okay, well, I'm going to start doing this. 
I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to try and do this. And it's like one of those things where it's like, we tell ourselves we're going to, and we'll all get on that tomorrow or like next week after this or like, and then like years pass and you're like, I have no idea what's happening in my life. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Where, where did that go? And um, <laughs> one of the things that um, I, I wrote down this quote, because I thought this was so great. And this speaks to the, you know, the sort of issues of queerness and being a, a family, being uh, having kids as, as a queer couple. Um, there was something where Sammy notes, it was as though your friends all thought you'd aged out of queerness just by creating a family, that somehow there's like a disconnection from that community that, um, you know, that Monica and Sammy had before simply because they have kids mm -hmm. and they're in central Florida. I mean, if you come around the Boston area, like you can't throw a stone without hitting like a, you know, a lesbian mom you know it's like but i you don't think of central florida as being like this bastion of yeah. queer community and especially not queer parents so yeah um yeah, yeah. That, that was like a very like a, a big part of this book to me was like writing like queer parents but it was also like i want to engage with like how queerness like um and queer spaces function in specifically like in orlando proper or like central yeah. Florida. and like a lot of that is like there are not a lot of like actual like queer spaces like you have a couple nightclubs and that is like what you have and the idea of like um those spaces like there's spaces that are like kind of queer in central florida but they're not like labeled like right there's like we have like gay ihop uh like gay chilies but it's like those spaces turn into queer spaces because it's like um like they happen to get some gay management and the gay management hires some queer people or queer friendly people. And then people who are queer start going to those spaces because it feels like a, a space that is, yeah. cool. but it's not, it can be taken away at any time. It's not always going to be gay. I hop, right? Like it's like right. all we all manager leaves and then it's like not that anymore. So it's like those spaces aren't there. And so then also I was like, so much of the queer spaces that are available for this like wealth of queer people that live in Orlando, because lots of people come who are queer to Orlando to work at theme parks. Right. So have like tons of queer people there, but not queer spaces. And the stuff we do have is like very affiliated towards like single life, young single life, like right. teen culture. Um, and like, you know, not like navigating around family. And so right. then if you're thinking about like queer people quite often have this kind of like secondary kind of coming of age or like mm -hmm. kind of like going through like kind of like, you know, like when you're a teenager and you're a queer person, like so much, not everybody, but like for like for myself as an example, like was me navigating how to hide who I was. Mm. I was not like, you know, I was like, I need to figure out how I have to mimic the people around me to try yeah. and figure out like how people behave so I can mimic that and behave that way because I don't want to be whatever it is that this is. And I need to like be like trying to to mimic it and so yeah. then when you come out there's this almost delayed adolescence because then you're relearning how to like do how do i make friends that are gay like how do yeah. i date gay people like i don't really know anything about like pop culture or what we like and it's kind of like this thing of like relearning over again so right the person who's done that and then like all there is in this like space in central florida is spaces that are like young single people and then so you're like okay well I'm getting married to another woman and we are going to have a kid. And there's not, there's no one to look at like as like a, well, who's an example I can kind of build off of. There's no framework. It's like mm -hmm. navigating blindly. And then all the people that you're interacting with are like, Oh, we're in a space where we're going out. Like you, you can't come out with us to like, yeah. you know, like the gay drag burlesque night, like 11 on like Saturday, I guess. Right. Like, yeah. Like never. So yeah. it's like, right. Like it's like, okay, I worked really hard to build this sense of community and family and now it's gone and I don't know who I am. And now I have this other thing and I don't even know how I interact with it or if I like it, like that would be really hard. Yeah. So like important. I was like, okay. So like, not only is this kind of like, feeling of claustrophobia, but a sense of like, kind of being like, I have no idea who I am anymore. I thought I was this queer kind of person, but right. obviously I'm not because that's gone and I don't really know where to look or how to be. And my only like thing I can look at is, you know, like if I'm going to join like a mommy group and it's like pretty much all straight people. And I really like, I'm here I am and I'm a lesbian and I have my kid and like the issues like aren't the same, like some of them touch for sure. But then it's sure. like, I don't know who to talk to about this and I don't have anything, right? Or it's, or at least nothing right. local. Um, so that was, I was like, this is very important to me. I want to really think about that, thinking about this book. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's that, um, 
that sense of isolation. And then, and not having people to sort of understand the unique pressures that are, um, you know, I, it, it's enough pressure just to like be a parent and like be a parent in public. And you feel like people are, are I did when and, and do like, especially if you've got a, you know, challenging kid, like you just feel like people are judging you. You feel like people are like, oh, you know, she must not know what she's doing or, oh, you know, they make, a, or you're, you're imagining they're making all these assumptions. So I would imagine like, if you're a queer parent, it like there are all these other pressures that yeah. people's yeah. expectations and stuff. Yeah, and it's like in a space that's like Central Florida where it's like very, I mean, Florida's a red state. It's like, you know, there's like very conservative pockets. Um, mm -hmm. sure. And it's like, you know, even like on the like government on the local level is quite often like very conservative. So right. it's like um, a kind of pressure being like, okay, this is what I've chosen to do. I'm, I'm building a family with somebody and being like, people constantly examining you, waiting for you to fail. Yeah. Like, because this is like, it shouldn't work. So I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm waiting for this to like not work the way. So there's like a lot of pressure from that. But then the opposite side of that being like, if I mess this up, then I feel like I'm essentially ruining it for any other queer person that wants to have a kid because it's like, oh, people are looking at me as like a shining example of like what this has to be. I have to be perfect because if I mess it up, then it means right. like, other people will be judged by the same thing that I did. And that's like yeah. a double whammy of pressure. Plus, because you're totally right. The idea of being like a parent, you always have people looking at you and being like, I'm looking yeah. at the internet to know that. People will like post anything about their kids and like they're like, there's just people that'll be like a pile on where it's like, oh, that's what you're doing? Or like, yeah. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah the judgment the judgment is insane. Like I, I used to write a mommy blog, a mommy blog when that was like, remember that was a thing? Like mommy yeah. blog. <laughs> You know, and like the the people just feel it, entitled to like chime in and be like, well, no, this is the way you, you know. Yeah. That's I disapprove of that. But yeah, yeah, hearing you talk about that and this idea of like you have to be this shining example. I mean, that, that's the same pressure that I think you know people of color feel. Like I need to be the representative of, of my race, or I you know my it, and it's like yeah, I mean it's it's huge. It's oppressive. It's Florida humidity. Yeah. I mean, the idea that any one person is supposed to be representative of an entire group is just like really ridiculous. Like it's just not, it's not reasonable. And it's also just doesn't, it doesn't allow for any kind of failure. And it's like, as human beings, we're like so fallible. And like, so like, we yeah. just like, we're messy and we fuck up a lot. Like things happen. And it's like, there's just like, there has to be room for like, error and when there's not yeah. that kind of thing i think it leads to like a lot of like right like kind of like kind of pressure cooker kind of thing where it's just like whatever it is can't take it yeah no absolutely yeah and and that pressure i you know is part of what i you know leads sammy in the book to to act out in ways you know and do sort of some kind of reckless things and i was really struck by there's a scene where she goes to the gay bar and she you know is getting plastered and on drugs also but like it's like she's forgotten how to how to be there you know and she she kind of crosses a boundary and like touches someone and and um yeah it, it's 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 like she's trying to to break out of her routine and the claustrophobia but it, instead of it being like feeling easy it's like she's like Wah, I can't deal I can't do yeah. that <laughs> uh, it was like very important to me too to write into this like scene because I think it's like um I mean, cause this is like a thing where it's like, right. She's trying to reemerge into like, like this place in her life, like you know, having a teenager and like, now I'm trying to like date again or like, what does right. that look like? Or like, I want to like move into a space, but she, instead of being like, here's who I am as a person. And here's like where I'm entering from is like, well, the only thing I remember of being queer was like being like in my twenties and like wearing yeah. these clothes. So she like literally is like, okay, I'm going to wear these kind of clothes I wore before I'm going to like, show up with this like makeup that I don't really wear anymore. I'm going to like approach people in the same kind of way that I maybe yeah. would have when I was like 23 at a bar. And mm -hmm. it's like, there's like this kind of like sense that like nostalgia is like, nostalgia is like a thing that is like a very tricky thing and like very dangerous quite mm -hmm. often. Because nostalgia colors over everything and like makes it have this kind of rosy glow and a memory. Mm -hmm. And in reality, that's like, that's not how things function and it allows us to kind of like misremember or like not really re like have an idea about how things were right. so her showing up to this like bar and interacting in that kind of way is this kind of like hoping for like wish fulfillment like take me back to this place where i was previous to this and that's not reason that's not a reasonable yeah. way right, to right. Her into a situation like that and also because um 
I think it's very important that um, queer people, as a, as a queer person myself, like talk about like the idea that there's like consent issues and boundary issues, even in queer spaces. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of um, pressure ideas that like, oh, this happens like only in like in, in kind of like straight or heteronormative things. Like we're expecting right. like men to behave in this kind of way. Right. And in reality, anyone can do that. Like sure. including queer people, just because something's queer doesn't mean it's necessarily a safe space if like people are like pushing boundaries or, you know, like not behaving in kinds of ways. So I was like, you know, I'm going to put her in this situation and see how she behaves. And like, you know, her behavior is like crossing boundaries because she's just a person who like sometimes doesn't respect other people's boundaries because no. right. she doesn't like, um, she's not able sometimes to see outside of her own like frame of reference. Right. So, um, and yeah. there's some very blatant examples of that too. I don't want to give away, but there are a couple of times where she's, you know, physically crossing bound, not just in the club, but other things she does where it's like, she's trying to bust into other people's lives and, yes. and, you know, get at them, inhabit them, understand them. Um, but yeah, I it's just like such a great flawed character. And I, I, freaking love a flawed character. And I hope you aren't getting those reviewers who are like, I didn't really like the character. She was so unlikable. I, that's the worst. <laughs> not I mean, I did like her because she was flawed, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things too, where it's like, um, I think it's, uh, I mean, we're, we're just going to get that like writing, like characters who are like messy, who are women sometimes I think, I mean, if we think about the ways that, um, we look at, um, women who are flawed in like television shows or movies and how like the the public response to those characters. I think a lot about the uh, the character, the the wife on Breaking Bad, like mm -hmm. Skylar, people mm -hmm. had like I have such a sincere hatred for that woman where it's like, it, it's very interesting to look at like how we're choosing to like really like demonize somebody in the context just because they're a woman and there's like this expectation of like yes. they're going to behave in kinds of ways and we need them to be redeemable or like have some kind of moral center or like right. be like consistently like um behaving in kinds of ways and that's just not how people are like yeah, it's no. reasonable and i was like i really want to write i'm also a person who's queer and i was like i i write queer characters and i was like i'm not gonna write necessarily someone who's like behaving right or being like super redeemable because I feel like I need to like not everybody is and like it should be like completely reasonable for that there would be a queer person who's messy and fucks up and is maybe not a great mom all the time. Right, right. right. Like that's just not how people people are. And right. I think there's sometimes like a little more leeway when it comes to men behaving that kind of way, right? Like there's Definitely. plenty of like terrible dads in fiction and movies and things and they don't get like nearly as much black as like-, well, movie, like Cause it's like, oh, ha ha, they're hapless and yeah, whatever. yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, so we have some questions um, from Rena. How did you come up with this interesting title? And I have a theory that uh, <laughs> you explain cause there's excellent stuff having to do with teeth, but yeah. yeah. Um, it was, um, fascinating to me because this book originally was called Samson. Um, I had titled it that and my editor gently coaxed me into considering writing a new title for it. And so I spent like a really long weekend being like, okay, coming up with titles and trying to think of some different things. And so, so hard. Yeah, yeah, really, really hard. Oh, what am I going to call this thing? <laughs> this giant thing I've spent a lot of time like submerging myself in, but it became a thing where, I mean, there there's a lot of teeth in the book, um, like literally and like metaphorically. There's yes. like, so, so much of like this book is like the idea of like a, this kind of feral behavior almost or like mm -hmm. how we, how we like, right. Cause there's like the idea of like how teeth bite down, how teeth sink in, how teeth like will hold or cling or like clamping a jaw and like, um, the feralness of that felt important. Plus there's just like plenty, there's lots of biting in this book. There <laughs> is, yes. <laughs> yeah, I love that. There's biting and yeah. But yeah. the idea of like something having teeth, you know, yeah. having meaning and having meat to it. And yeah. yeah. I mean, I wanted it to be something where it's like, um, cause it's like, right, like Sammy quite often as a character, like she says things not like glibly or like doesn't move through life. It's like, she, she means it. It's like with teeth yeah. quite often for her. Yeah. Like, He's like, here's like the kind of way in which I'm gonna like really bear like right. my things and have this be like a thing that's like I I really mean it. <laughs> right. Yeah, she's not yeah. holding back. So yeah. yeah. All right. Sylvia would like to know how long this took you to write. Oh, that's a really good question. Because I think um 
what it became, like when I, when I was writing from that scene, like when I chucked the rest of it and sat down to write, like from that abduction scene, it was a pretty quick process. Um, yeah. Once I figured out what it was, that draft kind of flew out of me because it was like, I was so close to it all the time. I was writing like 2,000, 3,000 words a day like working wow. on it. Um, it took me, um, I would say I had like the, the initial like kind of 70 pages of it that River had bought right. at, at auction. And I worked on it then from that month, which I think was like August. And I sent in the draft to my editor February 1st of 2020. So like not very long. Like it was, yeah. like, I, I, and, and it's, has, it stayed relatively the same after I sent it to my editor. So I, less than a year to like wow. put the draft together. Cause it like, it required a lot of my attention. Yeah. My, my book before that took like a lot longer and mm -hmm. I, um, that book stayed basically the same also, but I spent so much more time like in right. something of that. And this one, I was like, I felt like I was like this to the screen. I was like, mm, like, yeah, I was, like, yeah. All the time. I'd get done with like a day of writing and I'd be like, I when I tell you I needed a beer afterwards. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you also had like that. Was it hard for you to have that? You know, your, your first novel was a, a bestseller. So like, mm -hmm that must have been an added like mind fuck to be like, Oh my God, how do I live up to this? It was stressful too. Cause also I was like, I, n I never want to be the kind of person like, cause I feel like we're, I mean, writers and musicians and like anybody making any kind of art, like whatever kind of art it is, like we, like we're, we're creators and we're not wanting to necessarily like remake the same thing over and over again. Right. So most of dead things was its own thing. And I was like, this is a completely different book and I want it to be different. Mm -hmm. And like, I mean, we'll see how like readers like approach it and sit with it. And that was hard. Cause I was like, this is a very different book than that last book. And I was like, but that's what I want to do. Like yeah. in terms of like work and art is like, like surprise myself and like yeah. really press myself and, and like, learn new things because I was like I also am a person that always like I never want to feel first of all I never feel like I know what I'm doing <laughs> I, I never want to feel like I'm like okay like I, like I this is the thing I know how to do I want to be like learning all the time yeah so this was like a book that was definitely like a learning process for me and I hope mm -hmm. that anything I work on ever I have that same kind of feeling that it's like pushing me to try right. and make something that feels out of my comfort zone <laughs> right something new and i mean it's a lot more interesting that way rather than tr cranking out the same thing over and over yeah. so bozina or bozena bozena having read all the interviews that have appeared after your book was published is there anything you wish you had written differently given a chance oh that's an interesting one that is an interesting question and it's like a question i think i asked myself um afterwards and my my answer is like no i mean this is the book it was supposed to be i, I wrote the book that that this was and also um you know i'm a huge proponent of like i don't go read goodreads reviews like i don't read the yeah, reviews. Cool. yeah no. that's for the reader like that's not yeah. for me. that's their space to have and i completely am like yes that's like for you and i want you yeah. to do that um i also know that like like um I think Toni Morrison says it's like you write for your reader, like, and not everybody's my reader, and that's completely fine too. Like, yeah, you know, everybody gets to have their own personal perspective. Like, you know, right. like, you know, not everybody's going to like everything that you do. Like, they just isn't reasonable. Like for me, yeah. I was like, I'm writing this for the people who are looking to read someone who's like completely messy and wants to be like uncomfortable with me in this kind of mess a little bit. So. Yeah. I don't feel like I would change anything about this book. Um, cool. it, it's the book it was supposed to be, and I, I feel good about that. And that's that's all I ask for at the end of the day that I can right. feel, that I can feel good about like what I made. Right, right, absolutely. All right, I'm gonna throw up one more question, and then I think we're um, we're gonna pick a winner. So if you're out there watching and you want a chance to win a copy of With Teeth, um, you could just throw up a hi in the comments, and you'll be entered to win. Um, so here's. Uh, Having mentioned uh, Lauren Groff, Carl Hyacin, great company, by the way, how do you feel being considered a Florida writer? I, I'm sorry, I pegged you as a Florida writer. I didn't mean to, but <laughs> no, my I, intention. You know, I, I love to be, I hope people think about me as a Florida writer. That's how I want to be seen. I, I consider myself to be a queer Florida writer and it is honestly, um, it's it's a love for me. I love I love Florida. That's why I choose to write about it all the time. I want to um, I want to be associated with that. And I think like especially right now, there's this like really beautiful renaissance of like Florida writing happening. Like yes. 
Karen Russell, I think, is like one of our greatest living writers. So mm. I, I'm obsessed with her. So I love Swamplandia and everything she does. She's such a gorgeous writer. But we have like so many, like not even that, but we have so many like queer, like people of color who are writing like amazing Florida stories, different yeah. Florida stories from different parts of the state. Cause the state is massive. It is, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, um, so like, right. Like people writing about Miami or like Tampa or like the keys or like the panhandle, like those are all like so disparate. So different, and, like, yeah. The class stories and different stories from like different kinds of people are like, those are all different. So like, yeah, Takira Madden had like, Long with the tribe of fatherless girls come out, and that's about Boca, and it was like oh. such a beautiful thing. It was like she's like a biracial writer, and it's like writing like very much about like a different part of Florida, and also about being queer. And like uh, Shakira Diaz wrote like Ordinary Girls, and that came out. It's very much about Miami and like Puerto Rico, yeah. and like what that's like. And there's like so many different. So I am thrilled to be associated with that. I yeah. hope you like continue. I've always said too that like. I'll write about Florida until I'm like bored about writing about Florida, but I haven't gotten bored yet. And I don't imagine that'll happen anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I mean, I'm sure they're like, it's a, it's a huge state. It's a complex place. It's like a tons of stuff to mine there. And yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, can you tell us anything about, I know we know your, your collection is coming out, but is, can you tell us anything about what you're working on next in terms of what you're writing? Yeah, um, it's actually been because I think we've all experienced this kind of like creative drought being in like the midst of like quarantine and a pandemic. Like it's yes. been very hard for work. It's like great. Right, like you're kind of told like, oh, well, now you have all this time to work on whatever. It's like, oh, my God, no, no way. No my way. Brains broke. So um, just within the past like six months, I have. I have the drafts of two different novels and I'm working on a third one, just like kind of like, cause I feel like I wasn't able to work, wasn't able to work, wasn't able to work. And yeah. then all of a sudden it was like, you know, like vomit. So yeah, just, that all came out once. yeah. Um, so one, one thing, one of the, that I finished is about um, a librarian in Florida. So it's like a library book. Cool. And one is a story about sisters um, mm -hmm. and they're also in Florida. And this one I'm working on now, which um, I'm still in the, like halfway through, um, I feel very excited about. And it's one that I will say is like, kind of like a, kind of like a, a haunting, like, but it's also very much like rural Florida. Cool. So, very different projects, but yeah, I'm, that's I'm, fantastic. I'm excited to be working. So who, we'll see what happens with any of them, but I'm, I'm honestly just happy to be writing again. Yeah, that's what I know. I, it is kind of funny. I, I know some people who during the pandemic, some writer friends were like, boo, 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 yeah, great. Yeah. Um, that was not me. No, no. I was revising. Like, I was happy that I was already into something. I can't imagine like having, like starting something new in the midst of so much going on. Just I feel like I, all I could do is like, I could hardly read. So sometimes I was yes. like, I was like, I started like saying to myself, cause I was like, I miss reading so much. But every time I pick a book up, like I would just be so like, beside myself, my attention span was like, reading. and so I started rereading like books that I knew I loved so that I could mm -hmm. like, I felt a little more comfortable and get my way into it. And then like, yeah. but yeah, writing was the worst. I was like, Oh God, yeah, <laughs> I was, like, no, am I ever going to write anything again? No, no, exactly. It, it, yeah. That's what it felt like. So anyway, all right, let's, let's pick a winner to win this fabulous book. Um, Julia behind the scenes there, you want to throw up who are, our lucky winner is today. They're not getting this actual book. This is mine. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm keeping it. Christina Powers, you have won a copy of With Teeth. So please DM us on Facebook on Mighty Blaze. Make sure you've liked our page um, and uh, or email us. You can email a Mighty Blaze at gmail.com and you will we will get a book out to you. So awesome. Yay. Um, Thank you so much, Kristen. This was such a pleasure. Uh, I love meeting you, love reading the book and best of luck with it. And I can't wait to see what you write next. Thank you. This was so great. I appreciate you having me.